Good evening. Good evening. My name is Paul Holtgrabe. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the New York Public Library, known as Live from the New York Public Library. Since we have some people from abroad, I felt I needed to say again that my goal at the library is to make the lions roar, to make a heavy institution dance, and when successful, to make it levitate. It is a pleasure to welcome, I knew that I would get some laughs because people haven't heard that. It's a pleasure to welcome Stephen Greenblatt and Tony Kushner tonight. I am most grateful to Tony Kushner for having so warmly embraced the idea of speaking with Stephen about his new book just published by Norton, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve. Thank you so very much. After the conversation, both Stephen Greenblatt and Tony Kushner will sign copies of their books. Tonight's event is co-presented by the Holberg Prize. I'm grateful to Faye Rosenfeld for the, vi the Vice President of Public Programs to have brought this possibility to my attention and to Ellen Mortensen of the Holberg Prize. It has been such a delight and pleasure to work with Ellen on making this event tonight possible. Now, to say a few words about the program, about, uh, uh, um, excuse me, to say a few words about the Holberg Prize, we have the pleasure of welcoming here Sigmund Gronmo, the Emeritus Professor of Sociology and former Rector of the University of Bergen in Norway. Professor Gronmo. Good evening. The Holberg Prize, which was awarded to Stephen Greenblatt last year, is regarded as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in fields where there is no Nobel Prize, arts and humanities, social sciences, law, and theology. The prize is uh, awarded annually to uh, scholars who have made outstanding contributions within these fields, either from one discipline or interdisciplinary. The prize is uh, going to scholars who have had a decisive influence on international research. It is worth 4.5 million Norwegian kroner, which is equivalent of about 570,000 US dollars. The prize was established by the Norwegian parliament in 2003, and it is administered by the University of Bergen on behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research, and the university has appointed a board for the prize. So far, we have had nine laureates in arts and humanities, four laureates in social sciences, and one laureate from the field of law. The formal uh, ceremony for awarding the prize takes place in Bergen in early June every year. Then the uh, Holberg laureate receives the prize from His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince of Norway and uh, next year's ceremony will be on the 6th of June in Bergen, Norway. The selection of candidates, the selection of laureates, I should say, is based on uh, nominations of candidates from all over the world. University professors and uh, scholars from other research institutions, including academies, are entitled to nominate candidates. These nominated candidates are evaluated by an academic committee, which is appointed by the board. The committee consists of five renowned scholars from various fields of research and various parts of the world. The committee selects every year one of the nominated candidates as the recommended laureate, and it is the board which, based on the recommendation from the academic committee, which uh, decides formally and finally who shall be the laureate. The uh, next year's laureate will be announced on the 14th of March. Now, we are proud and honored to have been invited uh, as representing the Holberg Prize as uh, co-presenters of uh, the great event tonight. The uh, laureates are the best ambassadors 
for the Holberg Prize. And featuring Holberg Prize laureate Stephen Greenbet and his new book is a very meaningful way of profiling the prize itself. I'm back. Thank you very much, Professor Granmo. I, as always, I'd like to express my gratitude for the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos and Manaz Hispani Bartos for their support of life from the New York Public Library. I dearly thank them. I have always loved an essay by Stephen Greenblatt, which I have often quoted in conversations here. I take the pleasure now in, of reading the first paragraph from Resonance and Wonder. What Greenblatt says about these two forms of approaching objects reminds me of what Simone Weil said about attention when she wrote that attention is ap that absolutely unmixed attention is a form of prayer. The first paragraph of Resonance and Wonder goes as such. I propose to examine two distinct models for the exhibition of works of art, one centered on what I shall call resonance and the other on wonder. By resonance, I mean the power of the displayed object to reach out beyond its formal boundaries to a larger world, to evoke in the viewer the complex, dynamic, cultural forces from which it has emerged and from which it may be taken by a viewer to stand. By wonder, I mean the power of the displayed object to stop the viewer in his or her tracks, to convey an arresting sense of uniqueness, to evoke an exalted attention. Now, as many of you know, for the last seven or eight years, I've been asking my guests to give me a biography of themselves in seven words. Seven words that may or may not describe them, a haiku of sorts, or if you're modern, a tweet. Tony Kushner submitted these seven words to me, which remind me very much of what Pascal once said, if I had had more time, I would have made it shorter. <laughs> Tony Kushner's seven words are, Seven words? I don't really do pithy. <laughs> Stephen Greenblatt submitted these seven words to me. Would-be Epicurean, scholarly, storyteller, secular Talmudist, Bardolator. Please welcome them. Hello. Um, so I think the way we're going to uh, do this is uh, we're going to talk for uh, uh, about 45, 50 minutes and then uh, open the floor for questions for Professor Greenblatt. So, hi. Hi. Um, so I've, I've already told you in the green room, I adore the book. It's fantastic. And I thought, uh, since it's just coming out, um, and many people in the room probably haven't had a chance to read it or read about it, uh, I was going to ask you three uh, sort of obvious questions. One is, uh, just describe it, um, uh, it succinctly. I mean, what, what's the strategy? I don't uh, do pithy, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, who hissed at that? But there was somebody <laughs> like got very upset. Anyway, uh. In in brief, it's uh, it's the story of the story uh, of Adam and Eve, uh, which is um, possibly the most important. In any case, certainly one of the most important stories ever told uh, and circulated. And it's about uh, where that story came from and what its trajectory in the world was. Uh, and centrally, uh, I can give you 
give away my plot. Uh, the story is really about what it means for, uh, for a myth to become real uh, to millions of people, uh, for the, what looked like um, characters dancing on a string, for the strings to be cut and for them to start existing, walking around in the world, and then what it means for them, as happens to, to, to the real, uh, to begin to get old and die. Yeah. So that's, that's the plot. I mean, you said this great thing at the beginning um, of the book, you talk about it being a story, that the, the thing that makes it a story is action. Uh, and you sort of come around to that at the end of the book as well, that, that uh, it's, the, it's the having characters that make a choice and yes. do something. So as a playwright, I responded to that because I scream at actors all the time that the purpose of getting on stage is to do something. And uh, that action is what makes the story, it's what tells the story. And um, in a way, the book is, it's the story of a story, it's also, um, the, the fate of a story is it passes through a, a succession of periods of history and through the minds of various thinkers and artists who transform it from myth to reality to literature eventually. Yes, through the minds and through the hearts and through the loins of, of because it is a story that reached all parts of the people who received it and, and passed it along. And, one of the things that's strange, as many of people here will know, is that it's as if the creator of this story decided to try two versions of it, one of which had something happening and one of which didn't have something happening. So the, the first chapter of Genesis uh, is a story in which there is, of course, action, namely the creation of everything by God, but the right. humans don't do anything. Right. They simply come at the end of the, of the uh, six days of creation and they're told to be fruitful and multiply, uh, and they, it's not even clear that there's more than one. It's God creates the human in his image, male and female, he creates them, and there was a long history of speculation that that might mean originally they were just a single creature. Uh, it was uh, both male and female. A yeah. creature. And then so in the second and third chapter, we're in a different universe in which something is happening, in which we are getting action, as in a story that... Uh, that someone would write, or a play that, or a movie that someone would write, in which there are naked man and woman and a talking snake in a magical garden with strange trees uh, and a prohibition. And there we are in a different world, a world uh, in which a choice has to be made. And it is made, for better or worse, mostly right. worse. And, and <laughs> both the consequence of that choice, which is what the rest of the Torah and the, and the Bible unfolds, um, uh, is, is the subject of the book, but also the consequence of telling this particular story and of, of this story triumph. I mean, it's sort of, a, in a way, uh, a book about the consequences of storytelling and yes. of the transformation of the world through those uh, consequences, which um, spoke to me as a writer who frequently feels terrified to start anything. Uh, it's a book, in a way, about uh, the road that's taken once you launch out on the story yes. and also the road's not taken. The, the stories that get buried um, as a consequence of the story that you're telling and, and how um, serious an act storytelling is, yeah. that it isn't, it isn't an entertainment, it isn't a, um, uh, uh, um, a, a trivial thing, it's actually a world transforming This one event. was, so whatever, yeah. the, whatever the original intention of whoever it was who launched uh, this story, the consequences couldn't have been more, uh, more magnificent and more terrible over a very long period of time. I mean, so that for the three great world monotheisms, for Judaism and for Christianity and Islam, but especially for Christianity, this story is absolutely central to the way in which a very large number of people came to understand what it meant to be human in the world, what it meant to, uh, to uh, love, uh, to work, why you had to labor, uh, what it meant to desire, uh, what it meant to die, why you feared snakes. Uh, right. Everything seems to be uh, in this very tiny compass, a, a little more than uh, Paul Holdgraber's seven words, but not much more. Right. Uh, 
everything in the fate of uh, the species uh, seems to be, or you're tantalized with the idea that it seems to be explained. I want to get back to the question of brevity in a minute, but uh, <laughs> before I do that, um, how did the idea, when did the idea come to you to, to focus on the Adam and Eve story and to, to write the book? Um, I, you know, was there, a, was there a specific thing that you were working on that then suggested um, a larger uh, story, or was it, did it all sort of come to you at once? Is to it some extent, it, it, first of all, I've always been interested in the power of stories. And I'm interested, as I said before, in the sort of Pinocchio, weird Pinocchio moment that any Shakespearean would be interested in. The, 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 the fact that Hamlet and Falstaff and others seem to be real in the world, seem to have identities, often identities that are independent of the story that launched them. So I'm interested in, in how that happens. And this is the, uh, the greatest instance of that ever. Uh, but also, uh, it is the... Uh, the other side of uh, the book that I, previous book that I wrote, the book on Lucretius, a book called The Swerve, because the, the point about the, the book about Lucretius is that already 2,000 years ago, there was actually a f more, there was a fully developed account of the universe as consisting of atoms and emptiness the gods, if they exist at all, exist in a different universe where they're taking pleasure in the world and they have absolutely no interest in what we do, in our moral choices or our failures. That's not their concern. Their concern is simply having pleasure right. in the world. Uh, our concern, likewise, should be having pleasure in the world, maximizing it for ourselves uh, and trying for other people as well, and so forth and so on. A whole suite and of... And also evolution. Uh, and, a, and, a, and an account of evolution that we're a species that emerged very slowly out of a very complex process of just random atomic uh, conjunctions. The whole, basically, this whole very, very rich theory, which was in circulation uh, more than 2,000 years ago, so the, and then falls out of circulation. So I, implicit in being interested in that, as I am passionately, I was interested in the, in the other side. Why does it... Why does that account fail? Why does it disappear? What replaces it or stands in its way? What forces it underground? And there are many answers to this, but one piece of the answer, and a not insignificant one, is this story which says in so many ways the opposite, that we and in fact all creatures were created at the beginning, that there is no further evolution of other species, right. that uh, we were created by a god uh, who had an idea for us, which wasn't a random set of connections, and who gave us a prohibition, which we violated. This, uh, and everything follows from that. It, it is as if you took the Epicurean the theory and you just tried to, s to think, what would be the opposite of this? And almost all of the elements are here. And uh, it, this was the one over a very long period of time that, that basically shaped uh, our world, shape the Western world. Well, and also, as you, as you point out, in, in, its, in its original sort of um, uh, setting down in written form, it was a kind of a weaponized story. It had a, it had a specific political mission in the world, yes. which was to override not, not Lucretius, but other uh, Babylonian accounts. Um, but we'll get to that in one second. Uh, I mean, it, it occurred to me that you, when we were talking on the phone and you mentioned that in a way you thought of the swerve as kind of the mirror opposite of, of uh, the rise and fall of Adam and Eve. But it occurred to me that there were two ways in which uh, Will in the World, which is right before the swerve, right? Um, and the swerve and this book are joined. One of them um, being that there are three books about uh, books, texts, that, that had world-shaping uh, effect. The, the, the Shakespeare canon, um, De Rerum Naturae, and then uh, the first three chapters of Genesis. Um, there's a kind of... Um, uh, I mean, one of the things that I think is astonishing about the accomplishment of each of those books is, is to tackle a subject as vast as that. Um, in a, in a very, very uh, concise way. And I guess I wanted to ask, was the, 
does the task of doing that intimidate you? How do you begin to organize? I mean, there, the number of things that are referred, that are sort of casually, well, not casually, but effort, effortlessly brought in um, to uh, trace this history of, of the Genesis story for 2,000, 3,000 years um, uh, it is a, just a, a, an extraordinary number of, um, of sources, uh, both in the visual arts and literary arts, uh, and, and in history. Um, how do you begin to organize that? And yeah, well, the answer is yes, we, it's in very deeply intimidating, but also incredibly exciting, so, and arousing, and so it satisfies uh, the impulse of curiosity uh, that of a very intense kind that I've had since uh, early childhood. But in the succession of books that you uh, mention, in the case, the first case with Shakespeare, I profess at least to know something, not by any means everything, but I, I feel unreasonably, uh, reasonably secure and confident ground. Right. In the case of the book on Epicureanism, uh, much less so, and it was only after uh, my wife and I had spent a year in Berlin uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study, and, uh, which is a think tank, and there were two German, very serious German classicists, both named Christoph, uh, and, they, and we had a kind of reading group with them for a whole year, uh, reading through uh, De Rerum Natura, and I First of all, I saw what, if you were a serious cr classicist named Christoph, you would say about this poem, and I knew that I couldn't say it. I mean, I'm, I don't have that level of, of immersion in uh, these materials, but then I became less panicky that it would be something that I wouldn't even recognize, that it would be completely outside my uh, orbit. So I, I felt uh, somehow allowed to do it. In this case, I'm... Can I just add, when yeah. you, so with the, the reading group um, was something that just sort of happened spontaneously, or you... Yes, actually, it was my, I think like it was the <laughs> idea of my wife, Ramey, who thought that it would be fun to do this. I mean, but I was interested already in the, in the poem, but I had never tried to work through it in Latin and, a, uh, Latin and English, but in a, in a systematic, more systematic way. So it was a piece of good fortune, and then it deepened and deepened in the course so of the year. So did that precede your um, coming to learn of the story of uh, Paggio Braccioli and the... I, I knew that from an earlier, I knew, but I hadn't thought of working on it. I knew who he was because I... Uh, He's the... Uh, Paggio, Paggio Bracciolini was the man who found the book in a, in a monastery in, in uh, the early 15th century and re returned it to circulation after centuries long uh, and he's dormant sort of, along with Lucretius, one of the two heroes yes. of the swerve. He's the, you follow his... He's his a sort of oddly lovable character, even though he was Extraordinary. a bit of a, uh, He had some problems in his life, but uh, no, a quite wonderful figure. And I didn't know much about him, but I knew who, who, who he was. Because I, I'm interested, I was already interested, and this is relevant to this book, in how things come back, where they go, how they, they disappear for stretches of time and then surface above the water again and then disappear again. And so in, in all cases, and it's actually sort of worth reflecting on the fact that Homer, to take the biggest example, uh, that Dante had no access to Homer. It, he had basically disappeared in the West as a, uh, there were, he knew the story uh, through, through other sources, but he couldn't have read Homer. And it was only after the, fall of Constantinople and the exile of various Greek speakers to the West that the language came back. And there's a long, complicated history of this kind for, for much of the past, where things disappear and return. And I've always been fascinated by that. In the case of the rise and fall of Adam and Eve, I'm, on, I'm very deeply, and uh, I, I don't expect to bring you to tears, but I'm, I'm, I'm painfully aware of, of how much there is to know and how much I don't know. So there, um, I try at least, I tried over the last six or seven years to simply to become aware of what I don't know, not to master it, uh, but at least to know it's out there. And even so, there are huge parts of the territory I don't know. Uh, I'm not a pious person. I don't come from that 
kind of commitment. I'm, I'm a literary person interested in the history of stories. And uh, I am particularly interested in and know at least or profess again to know something about the Renaissance. So in the case of this book, there, there are, I've tried to swat up as best I could huge things, but, and I worked hard, but there are, I'm well aware of things that I don't know. And then there's two things to say about that. One is there's a lot of things that all of us don't know. And so you have to decide at a certain moment if you will simply go silent or if something is seizing you, will you pursue it even though you know you don't, you won't master the thing. And then the second thing to say is, is that I seized upon a set of figures who seemed to make a huge difference in the life of the story. And there I could actually, by dint of just a lot of work, uh, begin to understand what was at stake and what they were up to. And, and when you began, was the roadmap that you lay out in the book from the Yahwist to Augustine, or through Origen and Augustine, and then on into the visual arts, and then Milton, is, is that progress something that you had uh, known when you began to write, or did it was sort of, was it, I, I had, uh, was talking to Alex Ross, the music critic from the, from the New Yorker, who told me that the rest is silence is, um, uh, the original manuscript was well over twice the length of the published book. And the book seems so elegant and kind of careful, but it's uh, like your work, um, a vast subject. Yes. And, uh, and of course it makes sense when you think about it that, that it could, one way to approach it is to just write everything you can think to write and then kind of, um, I think what Alex said was carving away uh, various pieces of the marble until you got to the figure inside. Or do you? I did a lot of that, uh, painfully and, and even a little resentfully at moments. I helped by my uh, very gifted editor uh, Elaine Mason, who uh, uh, told me, no, no, really, uh, uh, at this point we're losing the story, we're losing the plot, uh, because I, there are thousands of byways uh, you could go to, and the book could be uh, easily 10,000 pages long. And though I didn't write 10,000 pages, I wrote a lot more than exists in this book, and a lot was thrown away. Uh, but that's okay, because slowly out of, in that process I began to get out of this vast mass of materials and out of many accounts that could be given, very different accounts that could be given, what story I thought I could tell about these materials, which uh, had to do with, as I say, with how obviously mythical figures could become so real to so many people. I mean, I, starting with the fact that whatever the figure, Gallup poll figures, the Pew, or maybe it's the Pew Trust figures of the number of Americans who profess at least to believe in the literal truth of the story, which is something like 40% or whatever. It's a very higher in America than it is in Europe, but very high percentage. Terrifying. Well, it's in, I, that's, and in a way we should talk about that, because it's, it, it, uh, we will. That's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> because I thought at first it is, first of all, I thought it is alarming. How is it possible uh, after, a century and a half after Darwin, after Lyle's geology, after all, that's, all the work that's been done uh, by the paleologists, a after, um, how is it possible that people who get CAT scans and, and, uh, and the rest of it still profess to believe in the literal truth of the story of all creatures being, being created on the uh, at the beginning of time and no further evolution and so forth and so on, all the rest I mean, of I think you, you give to um, really wonderful answers to that question in the book, but let's wait. Let's hold that till. All right. I I, um, I want to go through the the question that you keep referring to, which is how do these characters become real in this way? How do they gain the kind of um, force that they gain, um, uh, especially given the the sort of sketchy quality of the original material? Uh, sketchy in the sense of. Pithy, um, not. <laughs> it's the word that's going to haunt us for the rest of the evening. Not dubious. Um, <laughs> but I, there's one last question I want to ask you that about, uh, again, the, it seems to me a connection between Will in the World and the Swerve and the rise and fall of Adam. And you, you've mentioned it already that you're in you have an interest in, in texts that 
that appear and disappear. Um, and in a way, the, the three books feel like um, they're a, a form of literary detective work. There's a, there's a, um, a, a reclamation from oblivion going on in the work that you're doing. I mean, with Will in the World, um, the most vivid portrait of Shakespeare, um, sort of plausible vivid portrait of Shakespeare um, that contains a, an analysis of, of what might have been going on inside him. And I think you do the same thing with Milton in, in this book uh, that, that feels enormously convincing and, and uh, persuasive. But, you know, uh, an author whose work has never been in any danger of vanishing, but the author himself has you know, been the subject of various weird theories and has is blanketed in a certain amount of mystery. Um, and obviously, The Swerve is about a poem that disappears for thousands of uh, How long was it? On and off, for, or right. go, it comes and goes for, for se several thousand years. Several, so yes, and, uh, and, then, and then re emerges to completely transform uh, human consciousness. Um, and, and then repeatedly um, in, in uh, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, uh, th the story turns to works that, um, starting with Babylonian cuneiform tablets, we just saw some in the collection of the library here. Uh, um, the, I, you seem to be very moved by the question of how things survive, how, how um, easy it is for the teeth of time, as you say at one point in the book, to devour uh, beauty and knowledge and how some things escape that and some things don't. And I've always been completely fascinated and turned on by uh, books that vanish and then come to light um, after they've presumed, after they presume lost. Um, you know, in American theater, of course, Long Day's Journey Into Night was put in Bennett Cerf's vault after it was written in 1939. Uh, it was supposed to never be performed. Um, anywhere on stage ever, and was only supposed to be released uh, uh, 25 years after O'Neill's death I didn't know in the mid-70s. Uh, so weirdly, um, Glass Menagerie and Death of a Salesman were written by playwrights who had never seen Iceman Cometh or Moon for the Misbegotten or, most astonishingly, a Long Day's Journey, which seems to have given birth to them as this weird kind of, you know, and I love that. That was one of my. And I'm, Melville also has. Uh, there are a number of stories connected to Melville's work. What is that about? I mean, do you do you have a? Why do you think that that is such a particularly thrilling? I guess for people who love books, it's a. I mean, it's partly. Uh, we, first of all, everything is fragile, much more fragile than we think. Yeah. Maybe now we think we kind of finally getting that it's all fragile. Uh, we th things that we think are absolutely rock solid can uh, disappear quite easily, actually. And it, to keep them going, institutions, uh, uh, works of art, uh, works of, of literature, uh, the, the, the things that we pass, won't want to pass along to our uh, descendants, turns out to be much trickier than it looks. It requires uh, enormous collective labor, and it requires an effort of renewal. Because if it's just the same thing over and over again, it w will uh, probably vanish. And I'm interested in, as a, in, in how that's done. It, the model, actually, in some ways, is, is a th theatrical one, that say, Shakespeare. Because the interesting thing about Shakespeare is that the, if it was just a set of texts that were not continually renewed on stage, I think it, it would only exist as a form of compulsory chapel. Uh, for for uh, unhappy undergraduates, uh, but it, it actually that's not the way it is. It's incredibly alive, and it's incredibly alive because it's constantly recycled and transformed and revivified. And actually, strangely enough, that's true of something that looks like it's been d didn't need that help, namely uh, the story of Adam and Eve, which is constantly revised and revisited and transformed by lots of people who invest themselves in it. And I'm fascinated by that investment. One of the reasons that I, you'll get mad at me, but one of the reasons I ha wanted to have this conversation with you uh, is that uh, you know something in a deep way from the inside about what it is to make, to make something that, as the writer of Lincoln, uh, let's say, and lots of other things, to make something that come back to life, that looks like it 
has vanished from us, to give it back. And I'm not sure how it's, I certainly don't know how, to, how it's done in the way that you know how it's done, but, the, but I can see how it happens here. And that, how it happens here in the story of Adam and Eve is that a succession, a succession of lesser talented individuals, I can use myself as a model, uh, pass it along. But then every once in a while, someone of tremendous power comes along and he or she puts body and soul into passing it along. In fact, as if anything is seized by this, by this story rather than seizing it. And I'm fascinated by that, what it means for a story to actually get its hands on somebody rather than somebody getting his or her hands on the story. And that's absolutely true with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve has the life of it had in our culture because, not because Augustine was looking around for an interesting story right. that he could use, but because the story seized him, grabbed him, and wouldn't let him go for his whole life. And that was true of, of the other figures that I write about in the book. Yeah. Well, actually, let's start, before we get to Augustine, let's start at the beginning of, of the story that you tell. Um, and uh, because this is something that was completely uh, unknown to me, that, that, that the origins of, of the, the written Torah um, most likely are uh, during the time of the Babylonian captivity, um, since it's the day before Erev Yom Kippur, it's, and we're two Jews, uh, you know, here we are. So, um, but the, 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 um, that there was a, um, a, a very political um, consciousness behind the, the writing of this, of this creation myth. Um, can you? I can. I can, but with the, with the caveat, but I probably don't need to tell you that I'm, uh, I'm walking on uh, extremely shaky ground, not only through personal ignorance, but through collective ignorance. We don't, we don't know, know collectively whoever the we is here. There are lots of opinions about this. The, it, it, one highly plausible hypothesis is that the, that the written uh, Torah, the five books of Moses, exist in effect in the wake of and because of the political catastrophe to the Hebrews uh, in the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century, and that, that losing your land, having your temple burned down, having your God look like a pathetic failure uh, because you lose in a serious way, you've backed the wrong people, uh, and expect the help from the Egyptians which doesn't come. Uh, that that catastrophe leaves, leaves the Hebrews uh, with a, a crisis of what, what has happened to them? What has happened to their God? And the Psalms are actually full of, full of deep, uh, as is uh, as some of the prophets, deep reflections on this disaster. Uh, Including the, the, is it Psalm 22 that you're, the, um, uh, by the waters of Babylon? Yes. You're pointing out that that the Babylonians who who have um, kidnapped, taken this huge crowd <laughs> of um, of Hebrews uh, out of uh, uh, Judea and brought them to uh, the, to Babylon, asked them to sing uh, a song for the for the captors. Yes, and, it's and a kind of African American weird quality uh, to it. The, the, the like slaves are supposed, to, supposed to entertain the masters. entertain the masters, and that there's a refusal <laughs> to do that. In, in, that's expressed in the, in the psalm. Um, I found that tremendously The psalm that moving. imagines at, the, at its terrible end, this is, yes. is that, that uh, what, what it would be like to, to cast the infant, the Babylonian infant, uh, on, the, uh, on the, the stones. Right. But uh, as I say in the book, actually throwing babies on the stones turns out not to be the way in which the Hebrews succeeded in, in uh, surviving, not by killing infants, but by rewriting a story. Right. Uh, and rewriting the story of, of the creation of the world to make it clear that it was not Marduk who created humans. It was a Babylonian uh, The Babylonian god. god uh, but rather Yahweh who did. And by rewriting the story in, an other, in other remarkable ways, because the amazing thing about the Babylonian creation story is that it's all about uh, 
how difficult it is to nap when there are too many babies in the world. The Babylonian god, uh, the, the humans have been created to work in the garden, but really work in the garden. They say dig irrigation ditches in the Babylonian uh, story uh, so that the junior gods don't have to do like one's teenage children. They don't want to do uh, this work, so they create these other creatures out of mud, uh, the Lulu, they call them, to do the work. And it works, actually, the device works very well, except that the creatures reproduce, and they reproduce, and they reproduce, and they, uh, they're not because they're wicked, they're just incredibly noisy. Uh, humans in large numbers are noisy. Uh, uh, and the god, who, the senior god, who wants to sleep in the afternoon, can't sleep, uh, being constantly awakened by this noise and decides th that's it. I'm, I want to get rid of them. Uh, and it's not about a mortality is introduced in the world not as punishment for an act of transgression. It's just introduced it just for, it's for making too much noisy, noise. Right. Yeah. But it, and which is kind of wonderful and nuts. But also, um, the point that you make about it, which I was, uh, I really loved, is that it's the, the noisiness and crowding is an urban condition, and that that part of the recasting of the myth of creation, <laughs> or the the sort of focus of the myth of uh, creation that the Hebrews were were uh, encoding, was um, the was a rejection of the uh, urban in favor of a, of a sense of the rural, that it's not the city that's at the beginning of things, it's, at, it's, the, it's the pastoral, it's the garden yes. in the middle of, uh, you know, it's two people by themselves in this paradise with a bunch of animals. It's not a, a crowded, noisy place where you have to wipe out half the human race because it's just keeping you from getting a good nap. Yeah, we don't really know what, I mean, now there's uh, disputes among Bible scholars it's probably the case that the Hebrews were relatively cosmopolitan, uh, but they had a fantasy about themselves uh, the way the English aristocracy does, uh, of being rural uh, people, I mean, who have a country seat, as it were, somewhere, or have this fantasy of an original beautiful garden, not, yes. not the city, whereas the Babylonians had the, the, really did have the dream of New York. I mean, they wanted a big city. And they had one. I mean, you, you make it uh, the point that, that the um, uh, Hebrews in exile uh, re reject urbanity in, in part. I think this is uh, something that you're uh, saying, that uh, reject urbanity because they're in the middle of the greatest city in the world, the city of their captors. Yes. And they envision it all coming down and falling apart. The dream apart. is, of course, yeah, Babel. Right. Uh, that tower which will eventually fall. And there must be a kind of schadenfreude at the, at the thought that this whole enterprise will collapse. Which happens with very spooky yes. speed. I mean, almost immediately as soon as Nebuchadnezzar is gone, yes. the, uh, the city is destroyed. There's also um, a moment when you make the point, I hope I'm, I'm that, that another enormously significant change is that um, uh, God makes the, the beings in the garden in, in Genesis, but he's not in the garden in Genesis. He's, not, he's different from, for instance, in Gilgamesh, or you have to help me with the name of the... Yes. Enuma the, Elish. Enuma Elish. Uh, um, and that, that creates a condition that then becomes kind of a central dialectic in the, in the Genesis story of alienation and... Um, uh, um, the possibility of agency, of, 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 of separate choice. I mean, it creates a distance between the, am I? Yeah, we get this, we do get this, of course, extraordinary image of God walking in the cool of the evening in the garden. So there is a moment, clearly, not only putting the humans in the garden, but seeming to take recreation there. So there is one moment before the, um, before it, uh, that the full expulsion from this takes place in which God uh, seems to be enjoying himself. One imagines him like a, as in a medieval painting in a robe walking uh, in, the, uh, in the carefully tended garden and enjoying the evening breeze. But after that, the humans are driven out and that seems to be the, 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 this one strange glimpse of a world in which in which 
there might have been some kind of coexistence. Coexistence, and then. Uh, but it, from the beginning, clearly, I mean, it's the interesting th one of the things that's so powerful and appealing about the story at the same time terrible, it, the humans uh, seem to be allowed to choose. Uh, they get, I mean, that's the nature of a prohibition. You could violate it. Right. Uh, the, and, and it was observed very, very early on that there are lots of problems with this prohibition. So this is no, it's not a modern discovery, but already 2,000 years ago, people were clearly worried about the fact that when the God tells the humans not to touch the, not to eat the apple from the uh, one forbidden tree, lest they die, that, that the God doesn't explain what die means. Right. And since they're living uh, at the beginning of everything, in, of evidently in a world without death, they, how would they know what, what that was? I mean, I, I sometimes imagine Adam saying to himself, you know, I didn't really understand what he was saying. Right. Uh, I have to ask him next time we have a conversation, what, what do you mean? Uh, well, you quote Mark Twain. Much yeah, Mark later Twain, in of course. Book, we very, know, works very this movingly way. saying we didn't know what any of those words meant. Yeah. And, there, and, and Milton, as you point out, that the, 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 the freedom and innocence are, are you know, incommensurable. They're, they're, Eve, I guess, I think it's Eve in Milton who says we're going to have death, whatever death is. They haven't, you know, they, they just don't know at this point it. Uh, what it is. And likewise, I mean, at, at the very center of the story, and its brilliance as a story, and a, but in a strange Kafka-like way, is that the one thing presumably you would need in order securely to observe the prohibition not to eat of the tree is knowledge of the difference between good and evil. But that's the only thing you get from eating the tree. Uh, and that too was recognized super early, so that the earliest surviving trace of the story, buried under the sands, uh, from the probably th third century of the Common Era until 1946 was a version of uh, an interpretation of the story in which the hero was Eve, not God. Eve for daring to, to know the difference right. between good and evil. And the, the, the sort of odd, sort of difficult to reckon passages are um, what after the exile is over and, and the exiles have returned and the temple is going to be rebuilt <laughs> um, and the sort of the political pressure that gave birth to this um, has passed, the, the way of contending with this now official account, this is supposedly written by Moses, um, uh, uh, is to turn it into a kind of an allegory, to say that its, its, its purpose, in a way, is to generate interpretation. Um, with, well, with because the, for, the, for the Hebrews, actually, as it unfolds, you've already alluded to the High Holidays. For anyone who knows the Jewish High Holidays, the story that is, even though Rosh Hashanah is, in some sense, an, uh, a celebration of the creation of the world, and therefore a return to this original story, it's not an accident that, that it's the Abraham story that was chosen to be uh, rehearsed. Because the Abraham story for the Jews and f as for the Muslims is the, it, whether it's Abraham and Isaac or Abraham and Ishmael as it is for the Muslims is in a way the, I, the story that's at the center of what it means to be this identity, this right. religious identity. Not the Adam and Eve story. The Adam and Eve story, uh, so the, 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 the rabbis had it's always the case, you know, sort of two rabbis, three opinions, or maybe four. I mean, that, that, so there are always, dis there are literal interpretations, but there are also uh, a, a strange allegorical interpretations of a wild variety of kinds, some of which seem to imagine them as real, some of which seem to take them as mythical figures, or little par parabolic figures. But it's really the Christians who, because of Paul, first and foremost, saying that Jesus is the new Adam. Uh, and in effect, Augustine says, if Jesus is the new Adam, we, we damn well better know who the old Adam is. Right. And there better be a real old Adam, just as there's a real uh, Messiah. Right, and so in, in, in your book, the big turning point and the first huge turning point in the life of this story 
is when Augustine becomes, as you say, obsessed with it, uh, a lifelong uh, concern about who Adam and Eve were and what actually we're meant to do with this story and, and begins this, this um, enormously difficult work of trying to figure out a way to literalize it, to reject the danger that allegory poses. That, that if you decide that, I mean, one thing that I thought was really wonderful was the notion that um, for a person to say, well, God doesn't strictly speaking mean exactly what he told Moses to write down, we're meant to understand that there's wiggle room here and room for interpretation, is in a way to recapitulate the, the sin of Eve, which is to decide that it wasn't necessarily a strict prohibition to yeah. not eat the fruit from the tree, and that we're not actually allowed that wiggle room, and that, that once you go down that path, Everything, Anything is including possible. Christ, becomes allegorical, and it's all meant to be a kind of a, a, a nice fable to you know, give you something to think about when you're going about your life, as opposed to divine truth. So Augustine sets himself and his formidable genius against this. And, and Just there were people arguing in this time, early Christians who argued, we don't need the whole incoherent, ethically incoherent Hebrew scriptures. Uh, people who had grown up not as, as Jews but as Gentiles and reading Plato and not reading uh, Deuteronomy uh, thought, what do we need this for? Uh, but if, if you, uh, Augustine and others felt if you throw this away, we're going to throw away everything. That everything. Follows. We're going to wind up throwing away Jesus who was after all fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. Yeah. So you present an... Uh, Augustine, who is both um, magnificently um, uh, perceptive about human beings on a very intimate level, I mean, the, all the, the stuff from the confessions, and is also something of a, of a monstrous figure. Um, and that paradox is yes. uh, breathtaking. It's, uh, I mean, we, it, we, we, it, it's, it would be nice if the people who made our world were were univocally sweet and kind and, and uh, beneficent, but that's not the way it works. I mean, this is an astonishing figure of great profundity, Augustine, and, and great humanity, and, uh, an awareness of what's in him, uh, what his desires are, what his fears are, uh, but it's in a way precisely because of those uh, desires and fears that he strangely comes out in what looks like a terrifying place of thinking basically that we are all by birth uh, filth tainted with sin even though we're also redeemed of course by God uh, if we are at least not all of us but some of us are redeemed uh, through our faith uh, but based on uh, his remarkable uh, notion which he gets from trying to interpret this story of original sin that we are just by birth this way, and it, it's a, it was at the time a terrifying idea. People said, you, you can't be serious. You can't be serious that the, that the infant that dies uh, a day after being born is, is going to go to hell. Right. Uh, yes, he was serious about that, but he was serious as part of a very big picture of, of damnation, but also redemption, but it's all built around this this story and the story of Jesus. And there's that passage that you quote um, of, and this is this is the paradox in one in one paragraph of this, of his observation of an infant, throwing it, you know, wanting something, throwing a tantrum when it doesn't get it, and it's absolutely magnificent. You know, it's worthy of Piaget. I mean, it's a beautiful observation. Of, of a, he seems of a to baby. have looked more carefully at infants than anyone yeah. in the ancient world. And his conclusion from it is that the infant is giving you a perfect illustration of the, of, is giving you proof of the existence of original sin in infants. Because the that, infant going like this is actually trying to hit, kill you. Right. Uh, or it's, hit it's you. I mean, he's not capable of doing it now, uh, but, but will be capable of doing it. Um, and that's a sign already. It's part of a, of a very big, complex picture. It's easy to reduce it, but it won't do to sweeten it, and it won't do to make it feel comfortable, because it's not comfortable. No. Uh, it's sort of path. I mean, he really, 
he, I remember when reading the confessions that he thought, well, this guy could be a, 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 a patient of an analyst. I mean, he's really like ready for the couch. Um, but by the end, when you're talking about his, his obsession with states of arousal and the control over, over sexual arousal as opposed to the lack of control over sexual arousal, you think you know, the, the analysis was not brought to a satisfactory conclusion. It's really, he needed more uh, sessions. It's, it's, uh, it's a very... It's the fact that you can't, you can't always wish it to happen or wish it not to happen. Uh, that bothered him. That bothers him. More than the sex itself. It's the idea that you don't have, uh, for something so important, that you don't have any uh, conscious agency. And conscious agency, sort of control of, of one's self, becomes, I think you right. say, the, the sort of the, the, the core of, of morality. And, yes. and, and then you make the point that the, the, the project of, I, there's one thing that you said that, that I just uh, adored, that um, Augustine's mistress, um, who he was with for 13 years, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, she was just sort of thrown out when his mother Monica decided that he should uh, take a wife from a, um, a wealthy family. Um, that the length of time that he was with his mistress and with whom he had a child, who may have been the child that he observed so lovingly and, and carefully, is the exact amount of time that he worked yes, just on, about, on yeah. the, uh, just about the exact same time that he worked subsequently on uh, his work on, to, to really dig down into the, the uh, um, uh, a kind of comprehensive uh, a comprehension of the Adam and Eve story, that these two things have a kind of an interesting connection. Yes, all, I mean, as if they were, yes, as if they as were if balanced against each other. He worked right. endlessly on the book called The Literal Interpretation of Genesis, and he couldn't bring it to a conclusion, and he usually brought works to a conclusion, uh, including immense works of, we just saw uh, an early printed version of, in the library of, the, of his great City of God. But in the case of the literal interpretation, he couldn't do it, and it's partly because um, this is a story that cannot quite be interpreted literally, and he knew it. Uh, and so he kept bumping up against those moments at which, for all of his interpretive cunning, he couldn't do it. And how should we say, in the long history of this strange story, that combination of tantalizing you and defeating you uh, has been repeated in different forms again and again. And it's one of, as they say, one of the reasons that the story seems still to, even after Darwin, still to live, uh, is that it's haunting. Uh, and, and in a kind of disequilibrium with itself yes. internally. There's also a parallel between what happens to Augustine um, and Milton, even though they're separated by 1,200 years, that, that uh, in one way, both of them may be abreacting some kind of personal uh, grief in, in struggling with the story, and then it also for both of them, the story has a, has a um, sort of defeats, uh, defeats the ability to, to master it, to contain it in its entirety. And you, again, I don't want to say this, I, have, I, 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 I hesitate to say it to you of all people, but in the case of Milton and as with Augustine, it's the very high stakes, all of them is there. They can't leave anything at the door. So that in the time that they're doing it, that they're working on it, and in both cases they work on thinking through the story for much of their lives, uh, they, they are at stake, at risk, completely present. Uh, they must have driven anyone that was around them, wild. And we know that Milton did. His, his, uh, his the daughter. People, the daughters especially, couldn't stand him. Uh, right. it, it must have been fantastically difficult to be with him. Uh, and it is be, be partly, I mean, it might have been just difficult anyway. There are people who don't write Paradise Lost who are also are difficult. Uh, but uh, it seems to be part of this uh, obsessive bringing everything uh, to, to this work. 
Uh, that's a good way to, to move, move into, I, I, wanted, I had asked Stephen if you would read a little section from the book. Would you still be? Sure, I'm happy to, and then that? I think we should. Uh, I, of course, have 800,000. I mean, we're barely through Augustine, and, and I still have. But, we, but I think we, I we're going to run out of time. Want to ask but, um, me and you 1,200 years questions. after Augustine. Yeah. Uh, Let me see if I can um, find it. I mean, the, the context of this is that, <clears throat> is that um, everything collapsed for Milton. It was a disaster. The revolution that he uh, threw his life into failed. He had gone blind. Uh, he had terrible di digestive problems. It's like a of Saturday Night Live routine. He had terrible gas. Uh, he, he, uh, his daughters hated him. Uh, he was afraid of being assassinated. He should have been executed after the uh, restoration of uh, Charles II because he had been complicit in the killing of Charles I. Uh, he lost all his money because he forgot to take it out. I of, have to uh, throw in the detail that you include in the book, that, that, uh, which I didn't know, that... Uh, during the the time that um, Charles II is is retaking London, and Milton knows that because he's become very publicly identified with Cromwell and uh, with the decapitation of Charles II's father, uh, uh, he's in serious danger, and he puts a poem on yeah. his door, basically saying, "If anybody comes to this door, you should know that you should try and help." the person inside because the person inside is a poet and you should help the poet because yes. he can spread your fame far and wide wasn't, if you was leave. it his most heroic moment? Uh, well, it's kind of beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it's what an artist does in the middle of a civil war. Uh, but he doesn't get executed and he doesn't get, um, he does go blind and... No, it's a catastrophe. So here, this is, a, the context is catastrophe. Um, though he emerged from hiding and returned home, he remained in seclusion. According to one of his earliest biographers, Milton was in perpetual terror of being assassinated. Many people wished him dead, but whether he had grounds for his fear is not clear. His public life, in any case, was over. A royal proclamation was issued calling for anyone who possessed copies of his, quote, wicked and traitorous works, end quote, to deliver them to the authorities who would see to it that they were burned by the public hangman. Milton was reunited with his three daughters, aged 14, 12, and 8. The blind father needed help. Though he had lost much of his wealth, he was still a man of means, and servants continued to do many of the basic household tasks. But the able assistance that he once had in his office as secretary, he was the foreign secretary, basically, of the revolutionary regime, who fetched him books and read to him, these were gone. His life's blood was reading, and now thrown back on himself, he craved more than ever access to his precious books. When some loyal friends paid him visits, he could recruit them to read, and he hired a young Quaker who had some Latin to come daily to his house. But the young man was periodically arrested. It was illegal to be a Quaker, and his help in any case was not enough. Milton began to demand that the girls read to him, often in languages that they did not know. He taught them how to recognize and sound out the Greek, Hebrew, and other characters, but he who had, been so deeply concerned, who had so deeply concerned himself with the education of his children did not bother to teach his own daughters how to understand what they were reading. When visitors to his house remarked on the strangeness of his daughters reading <clears throat> so many languages without comprehension, their father would remark jokingly that, quote, one tongue is enough for a woman, end quote. It was evidently regarded as a witty reply. In 1663, Five years after the death of his second wife, Milton married again, this time to Elizabeth Munchell, Betty, he called her, a yeoman's daughter 30 years younger than he. At this point, relations with his teenage daughters, in particular with his eldest daughter, Mary, had almost completely broken down. When Mary was told of her father's approaching marriage, she replied that it, quote, was no news to hear of his wedding, but if she could hear of his death, that was something, <laughs> end quote. The family all continued to live together under one roof for six years, but there was no sign that relations ever improved. His political hopes lay in ruins. 
his grinding labor and eloquent writing over more than 20 years were for nothing. His exultant enemies laughingly burned his books. Most of his wealth was gone. Many of his friends were dead or in hiding. His daughters, whom he had alternately neglected and bullied, hated him. He was unable to wield a pen, let alone read a book. Blindness and fear of assassins kept him cooped up. All was lost, and yet his inner world had vastly, incalculably expanded. Each night, or in the early hours of the morning, if we can believe him, he had, in this inner world of his, a female visitor. Milton called his nightly visitor Urania. The name was pagan, the ancient muse of astronomy, but in Latin its literal meaning is heavenly one. And she was for Milton the mysterious force within him that was enabling him at long last to write the great epic poem that he had dreamed all his life that he was destined to write. His prior attempts to write such a work had gone nowhere. He was able to show friends some scattered verses, but nothing more. Shakespeare had died at 52, having already retired to Stratford and given up his active career as a professional writer. What could the ruined Milton, who turned 52 in the year that Charles II returned to England, expect to accomplish at this late stage of his life? Yet suddenly, here it was, through the virtually miraculous assistance of a being he called his celestial patroness. I think we must take Milton's claim of celestial visitation, however strange it sounds, seriously. The muse would come to him, as he put it, unimplored. With her protection, he would descend into the underworld, he would soar into the heaven of heavens. Above all, if he could as if he could still see, he would wander by shady grove or sunny hill or along the sacred brook that bubbled up by the holy sites of Jerusalem. And he would emerge from these reveries filled with a peculiar music that he had never been able to sound, that had never before been sounded by anyone. He settled upon a routine. He would awaken at four in the morning, at five in the winter, and lie in bed for half an hour, listening to someone read to him, preferably from the Hebrew Bible. Then for an hour or two, he would sit quietly in contemplation. By seven, he was ready. An amanuensis would arrive, and Milton would begin to dictate the verses that he had composed in his head, that had come to him from on high, a welled up inside him. If the amanuensis was late, the blind poet would begin to complain as if he were in pain from what he was forced to hold back. Quote, I want to be milked, he would say. It would emerge from him in a rush. He could dictate as many as 40 lines of verbally dense, syntactically complex, unrhymed, iambic pentameter verse. He would have the lines read back to him, and then sitting in an easy chair with his legs swung over one of the arms, he would begin to adjust and cut and tighten, often reducing the 40 lines to 20. The whole morning was spent this way, and then it was over for the day. Fearing his belatedness and anxiety and anxious to bring to fruition what he had finally begun, Milton felt keenly the pressure of time and must have been eager to press on, but he knew that he could not force more lines to come. He had to wait for another night, another unbidden visitation. After lunch, he paced in his small garden for three to four hours at a time, or if the weather would not permit him to be outdoors, he would sit in a swing he had devised pulling himself back and forth. In the evening, he played music, received a few visitors, listened to poetry. By nine o'clock, he was in bed, courting sleep and the return of the muse. For long months, extending into years, these returns continued as if by miracle. The mornings would bring forth more verse, more occasions to be milked. The task was to keep going, to dodge the assassin's knife that he feared was hanging over him, and more realistically, to, to avoid infection from the bubonic plague that periodically ravaged London's population. By the summer of 1665, he had a draft, over 10,000 lines, of a stupendous poem to show his young Quaker assistant. What had seemed impossible had actually happened. Published in 1667 and then again in revised form in 1674, Paradise Lost was the bid for poetic immortality that Milton had confessed dreaming about in his youthful letter to his best friend. He had actually succeeded 
in rivaling Homer and Virgil. He had ascended the peak that Shakespeare had climbed. He had written one of the world's greatest poems. Thank you. Thank you. Does the muse, does the muse ever come to you in the middle of the uh, night? Just like that, um, no. I, I was especially the, I, I, I guess I knew that, that he had had a, a, a Beatrice figure that had, that had showed up or, uh, you know, um, uh, a Virgil that had... Not even had, once, Tony, not, not angel, an angel that's descended never, uh, never, upon you? No, no, I'm, I'm actually sort of glad that, that's, that I can say that. I've never seen anything, see, I mean, you know, I, no, never. I, 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 I got through the whole thing without having anything uh, that made me um, question my sanity, but, I, but it's, you know, and of course, you know, we're talking about Milton, so it's a tremendously moving account. I think that, I mean, I, I, I want to make time for the audience yeah, yeah, to ask please. questions. I, I just want to try and uh, come full circle a little bit. Uh, one of the stunning things about your reading of Milton is, is, is the way that you make connections between uh, the pamphlets that he wrote, the book, that he, the, the pamphlet that he wrote about divorce when he was in, uh, involved in his first marriage and separated from his wife and, and proposed a uh, sort of... Uh, No-fault uh, no divorce. Fault divorce. He came for, up with this idea, which is kind of amazing. And, uh, and got into trouble for it. Um, and, and as you point out, sort of uh, in a weird way, um, sort of uh, um, have, it seems premonitory, um, the, the pamphlet is published in 1643 or something, and then 1649 is the beheading of Charles I, and that there's a, that there's a, um, a kind of grand divorce of the people from the king yes. on its way, and that many of his arguments uh, are arguments that become um, uh, uh, enormous significance um, he makes an areopagitic, he makes them uh, explicit about uh, freedom of speech, but the, the, the notion of equality, of human equality, and of, of people not being born in a state of servitude um, are enunciated there and then carried through into uh, um, Areopagitica and then, and then, in a sense, into Paradise Lost. And that, that there's a reading that you give of, of uh, Paradise Lost, um, of the Adam and Eve section, of his need to uh, look for um, source material for bringing these two beings to a full kind of life. Shakespeare is his great model for what you can do if you create a Falstaff or a Hamlet. Uh, using his own marriage, using the, uh, the unhappiness of his marriage and also uh, his dreams of a perfect marriage. And, and, um, but also that this uh, kind of perfect marriage and, and then the, the disharmony that begins to seep in between Adam and Eve, um, specifically over the question of whether or not she should be allowed to wander off by herself, since Raphael has warned them that, yes, that yes. Satan is lurking around somewhere, and, and her uh, equality to him and her freedom from him, that that, that becomes um, the sort of the, the contradictions uh, that in a way, begin to uh, gestate and germinate uh, the fall of humankind. Because you, he, he, he must have been a very unpleasant husband. Uh, we know that he was a very disagreeable father. I mean, there's nothing, there's no point in trying to make a kind of, a kind of uh, hero that way for him, but he actually did think that a relationship, a loving relationship could only exist, a marriage could only exist as a model if there was real consent. If there wasn't, and he thought it had to go two ways. You can't have only one person consenting. So that, that uh, he insisted on this idea, though it seemed monstrous at the time, that you should be able to, both parties should be able to get a divorce if they weren't happy, if there's incompatibility, because God couldn't possibly have wanted you to be miserable in marriage. Marriage was created to make you happy, not, not merely to uh, fornicate or, I mean, to, to or, uh, uh, to work together, but actually to have pleasure with each other. So, I mean, it's an extraordinary idea. But then in Paradise Lost, there was speculation, already ancient rabbinical speculation. Why was the woman alone when the, when the serpent spoke to her? So one in the Midrash Rabbah, one line of speculation is that I love is that maybe they had just made love 
and Adam was napping in the <laughs> afternoon. Uh, and the woman, therefore, wasn't protected. Another speculation is that maybe, rabbinical speculation is maybe he had gone for a survey of the grounds in paradise. He was like a kind of landowner who hadn't seen his territory yet. I mean, wanted to see the back 40, as it were, and, and it wasn't around when the serpent came. But Milton has a profound and remarkable version of this uh, that, that uh, it begins with a problem of labor. There are only two of them. There's a very large garden to take care of, and Eve comes up with an idea which is that until they have some other hands, as she puts it delicately, to help them, uh, that they, they're doing too much kissing and talking during the day. Maybe they should separate for uh, a little bit. And Adam congratulates her in coming up with the idea of, of the division of labor, but that it's not necessary in paradise because they, this is Eden. They should be happy. Uh, and, and then he makes the fatal mistake of saying she shouldn't wander off because there's also an enemy out there. And she says, completely, as Milton understands, unanswerably, I might as well have remained a rib. Am I never going to go off? Are we, are we locked together forever? I mean, Satan is not a, in any case, we know Satan is not a temporary phenomenon. Uh, so, and Milton understands not. So this, it's unanswerable. Really, she and and Milton understands that it's unanswerable. That you can't have a relationship with someone who's forced to be with you. Uh, and he and and he puts that in there. Adam I mean, says Adam incredibly says movingly that that thy stay, if you're not willing to stay, if it's against your will, it's actually I'll be we'll both be more I'll alone. Be right. Uh, it's not a form. It's not a way to be together. And he allows her to go off. And then we know the catastrophic consequences. Okay. Milton knows the catastrophic consequences, but he accepts that as the cost of freedom. Uh, and he who, who profoundly, was a profoundly Christian believer, but thought his way through, as it were, to the other side of the story, uh, and to the side of the story that at the other side of, at the other end of which is, is Jane Austen and George Eliot and Henry James, that is say, mm -hmm. accounts of what it means to be in a real relationship with a, over a long period of time with people you don't always get along with and people you can't always be with every minute. Uh, and there's, Milton, couldn't, Milton could look back to Shakespeare, whom he loved, to see how to make Satan because he had Macbeth to look to and he had Iago to look to. But he can't find this when he looks back uh, in English literature, even to Shakespeare. He can't find it in the Macbeths and in Othello and Desdemona. He has to find what some place to invest. What about in Brutus and Portia? I mean, he, he, there's a tiny glimpse, very strange glimpse in Brutus and Portia, but of course, in the case of Brutus and Portia, Portia's going crazy because Brutus won't share right. what he has inside him. He's not gonna share it with her. But she, uh, the only reason I thought of them is that she tugs on his heart. Yes. In a way. And, and she says, she are we not it. married? Right. Uh, we, had, we have a little glimpses, but yeah. Shakespeare can't develop them. Uh, but Milton develops it. Yeah. He creates it. It's one of the most remarkable creations in, in literary history. But what is to me so moving about literary history is it's never purely literary. It right. also comes from some other place, from some much larger cultural surround. Right. And in this case, from a lifelong brooding about this story. And, and as you draw out really beautifully, um, it becomes political. In a, in a very important way, that the question of personal freedom and, and the relationship of, of, a, of the union of two people, of a collective, um, uh, the relationship of the collective to the, the privacy of personal freedom, the atomizing power of the notion of freedom um, is, is articulated in the yes. poem. It becomes an important part of what... I mean, it extends all the as Milton, and it extends in Milton, all the way from deciding if you don't... Uh, consent to being ruled by the, by the miserable son of a bitch who's ruling you, you have to change this. Uh, you have to do what you have to do uh, to alter the state of things. This is a, you know, this is a revolutionary sentiment. Uh, we, we must consent to our government. But he also thought this extended all the way to, to your domestic relations. You need to consent to, on both sides. He had difficulty recognizing that the woman had to consent to, but he was forced to understand that that was the implication, theoretical implication of his position. Yeah.
And let's 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 turn things out. All right. So um, good. Uh, yes. All right. Um, mm. Let's let's uh, open it up to you guys. If we have time. A little bit of time. Thank you. I think Paul uh, says there's a microphone somewhere. While people are coming up, I'm going to ask you one last little question. Um, I had asked you this backstage. Uh, the, the second half of the book, the last part of the book, after the writing of Paradise Lost and, the, and your um, uh, reading of Paradise Lost, you essentially, in a way, uh, describe um, the long process of, of the, the attempt to turn this into reality, beginning to die, the death of a myth, um, and the final nail in the coffin is Darwin. Um, I had asked you uh, backstage if you were in any way um, tempted uh, to talk about modern creationism because there are a huge number of people, as you said at the beginning of the talk, who, for whom this myth is still uh, not even a myth, yeah. it's, a, it's a literal truth. I haven't been, some of you may have been here to the, there is a theme park in Kentucky, I think, where you can ride, you can see Adam riding on dinosaurs and so forth and so on. I read about it, but I haven't been to it. There's an attempt to literalize this uh, attempt, uh, attempt to literalize this belief in, in the uh, reality of the story and somehow get dinosaurs into the picture as well. Um, There's in, the, my, one of my favorite people mm -hmm. uh, that I know nothing about before I read the book, uh, this man, Goss, who uh, <laughs> is in the middle of the Darwin Revolution, is trying very hard to be a science and naturalist, and he's trying to figure out how to explain uh, that Adam and Eve can literally be true, in spite of the fact that they're now looking at the chalk, uh, the buildup of, of chalk sediment, and proving that the Earth is actually millions and millions of years old, not 6,000 years old. And he comes up with a theory that um, God must have put a navel into Adam because Adam is a perfect example of a human being. And if, if uh, Adam had a navel, um, it couldn't have been because he had an umbilical cord because he didn't have a mother. So God put a false thing in Adam just to make him look right. And, and therefore, all the dinosaur bones and things and fossils and shale are something that God just put in at the beginning of creation to fuck with us. Um, <laughs> and I thought, God, that's so ingenious and scary. Anyway, so I'm sorry. I'll... I will first thank you both for this wonderful talk. Uh, and Professor Grimmett, you claim that you don't know everything. Uh, <laughs> I don't claim I don't know everything. <laughs> so the question is, uh, when you are making research for your books, when do you know how, uh, when to stop and, and start writing, when you have enough? Yeah. It is a wonderful question, and, and, and uh, I don't have a very... Um, a good answer to it except, uh, well, two answers. Uh, one is that I had to get, but it evolved slowly, and it was something that was Tony was asking me about before, a sense of what was the story I could possibly tell. I can't tell all stories about this. I'm not, an, I'm not adequate to tell all stories, but I gradually the idea of what it was that I could tell emerged, and then I had a clear sense uh, as it emerged of what I could uh, leave aside, even though I knew that many things I would leave aside might be interesting and might, in principle, alter the story. But then the second answer, which is connected to the first, is I'm painfully aware that life is short, that it does, nothing is forever. And you, you can, this was true, it's certainly true at my age, but it was true when I was much younger as well. There has to be a point at which you, you get out of yourself what you probably have in you to say about something. You could work for another 20 years and develop you know, finer grained versions of it, but the thing that is, you probably have something that is in you that you can discover relatively, I don't mean immediately, but over a few years. And then if you go on, and there are people, of course, who do this, and there, sometimes every once in a while it works, where they work 40, 50, 60 years on the same project. But often what happens is that it, it goes dead on them. They should have actually uh, found, by looking in themselves, what it was that they had to say and contented themselves 
with that recognizing that someone else will come along <laughs> and say much more. And I would say to people, and there will be people, alas, who will say, no, this is not adequate to this uh, amazing history, as it's not. Fine, go ahead, you tell the story uh, yourself, you do it. Um, because there are lots of ways of telling this uh, a story. I don't pretend that mine is the only one, but otherwise one would go on forever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is for Mr. Greenblatt. In the uh, introduction, you were described, among other things, as a secular Talmudist. Could you explain that? No, I was kidding around <coughs> with, with, I can't explain it, with Paul uh, Oldengraber. I, 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 I was joking in, uh, in response to his impossible request for my seven words that, that uh, I was thinking about the fact that, that uh, my mother's proudest uh, claim my mother and father were both born in Boston, uh, but their parents were born in Lithuania. They were very poor, but my mother's grandfather was what my mother proudly declared was a scholar. So a uh, scholar meant that he sat in the back room studying Talmud while his wife worked her fingers to the bone making a little money so they didn't starve to death. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I've always laughed to myself that, that th there was some line of, mysterious line of transmission that led, even though the particular form of knowledge that my uh, great-grandfather would have developed is not mine, for better and worse, that there must have been some line of transmission that led from uh, the back room in Vilna uh, to, to my uh, study on the third floor of the Widener Library. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you both for a stimulating evening. Um, Dr. Greenblatt, what are some of the characteristics that you have identified that give a story legs? Yes, it's a good question, but I, and I, I actually want, I will answer, but I actually want to, I know you don't want me to, but I'm going to anyway. We have one of the consummate storytellers of our time. Uh, in the room. I mean, uh, so, uh, it, 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 I, everything about this book has the, has the air of chutzpah, but I, even I don't have enough chutzpah to answer this question without first turning to you and asking uh, you. But when you say legs, what, what do you... That it lives over, over the years. That the story will live. Yes, it continues yeah. and continues. I mean, I'm I'm a playwright, so I don't think actually playwrights are very good storytellers. I think we we, we just put embodied dialectics on stage to sort of dress up in fancy clothes so they can have fights with one another. Uh, so I don't I don't. But you already really answered it. I think <laughs> certainly for me that you come with something occurs to you, um, and it just bothers you for a very long time, and you can't. You can't make it go away, or you can't, it, it keeps returning over and over. So uh, your story of this reading group in Berlin, uh, where everybody's suddenly sitting down and reading uh, Lucretius, um, the, the, if, it, if it's worth telling, I think it'll, it'll it just it's, it, it grabs hold of you and, and won't let you go, and keeps insisting that you come back to it over and over again until you, the circumstances in your life conspire to make it possible for you to write it. I mean, you know, you think about in that stunning passage that Stephen read, um, uh, the, the, the image of Milton having been devastated so completely, physically, emotionally, financially, politically, um, uh, that, that of course that was, that needed to happen before Paradise Lost could emerge and that there's, a, there's that kind of a price to pay. I think it's the, the, the conditions in your life arrive and come. I mean, in terms of legs, I think the story of Adam and Eve is a pretty safe bet in terms <laughs> of its, uh, staying power because it's something, as Stephen points out in the book, uh, you know. I mean, I, I wanted to say that I think that, that the, the beauty of this book um, is, is that it doesn't present uh, 
some sort of grand theory that explains everything, or you, there's not a kind of um, alpha male chimpanzee, to use a character who appears at the end of the book. You'll have to read the book to find out how, um, but it'll make you cry at the end. You actually will weep about two chimpanzees. Um, it, it, there's a tremendous modesty and generosity of spirit, I think, in all of your work um, the, that, uh, I, that I really love, that I really respond to, that I think makes you a, a very great storyteller. And you can hear it in the way that, that Milton is, is described in the passage that Stephen read. It's, um, it's a, a willingness to, to enter deeply into the life of the story um, and to surrender ego to that so that, that what is really happening is, is the story at hand and not some kind of uh, masquerade of self-aggrandizement. I think it's... Uh, I mean, one, you're absurdly generous, but one way of turning this uh, um, from what you've just said back to your question would also be to say that, that the... Um, well, first of all, what gives the story legs are, are the legs of the people who carry it, but what that really means is that, is that um, it, um, the, the crude and I think incorrect answer would be that it, uh, it helps to have an army carrying the story, and in some ways, this, for a long period of time, the story did have an army carrying it. I mean, it had a huge institutional apparatus that carried it along. Uh, but what is m fascinating and moving to me is that the story lived for a very long time without an elaborate institutional apparatus, and it's living now with a much reduced institutional apparatus. And that means that there's something in the story itself, that go, as I say, to go back to your question, that is independent of an enormous structure of, of teachers and, and people punishing you for disagreeing with it and so forth right. and so on. Something in the story itself. And that thing is, um, I, I, it's a little bit what I feel about Shakespeare, too, that, that uh, we think of, of artists as, as, as seizing upon these things, these stories, but it's also the other way around. The story seize upon people. This is an extreme case of something that seems over a very long time to have grabbed people. And, and I think it has to do with in this particular case, with this impossible, exquisite, and frightening combination of something eerily simple and something mind-bogglingly complex, uh, just pressed into the single tiny space, and so it, it's a, like a kind of nuclear core, radioactive core. Thank you. Great, thank you. We'll take one last question. So it better be good. Uh, yeah, I hope. <laughs> Not I hope to put nobody, any pressure on you. Uh, no pressure, yeah. Uh, I haven't actually have read the book, so I apologize if it, this answer is going to ruin anything, but we had also mentioned it a little bit before that you might have spoken about it. Is the fact that you, the title of the book says that it's the, the rise and fall of Adam and Eve. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, given that there are 41% people do, that do believe in the literal interpretation of this story, why do you think that there's going to be a fall of the story? Yes, and well, yeah. yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I have, first of all, uh, as I hope I indicated uh, already in multiple ways, deep respect for the continuing power of the story. That is to say, I think that, that the number of people who profess at least to believe in its literal truth uh, it depends not on, uh, not, at least not principally on gullibility, since I think gullibility is distributed very broadly across the population and not only in one direction, but on the actual, how good the story is to think with, how wonderful the story is to, uh, uh, how irresistible the story is to make sense of certain things that, that are tangles in one's life. But I think that it is the case that we may disagree, uh, that uh, the people who have given us, um, well, let's say, uh, CAT scans uh, and 
um, oncology, nuclear engineering, uh, and the understanding of the uh, evolution of species in the world don't, cannot believe in the literal truth, however much they might want to use pieces of this story in their life. And that's the fall part that I'm interested in, what it means that, that the 60%, if you put it that way, of America, even America, a highly religious country, can no longer credit the literal claim uh, that was once made so ardently for the uh, truth of the story. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to very much thank you. To the very first question that was asked of you, when to stop, it really reminded me of what my dissertation advisor said to me many years ago, that there were two kinds of dissertations, brilliant dissertations and finished dissertations. <laughs> so, I should have said that, yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.